It might be brutal, but dreadful is the best way to describe the last few weeks of Scott Morrison's political life. And with just a short time before we vote on his future, not even the mythical Scotty from marketing would take on the job of trying to repair the PM's battered reputation. But not all is lost. Enter Jenny Morrison. Funny, relatable and likeable, she's just about everything her husband's critics say he isn't. Will she be enough, though, to save him? It's curry night at Kirribilli House. I'm going to keep cooking. Yeah, I'm going to have to keep And cooking. in the most powerful kitchen in the country, the heat is on. Anything I can do, PM? Anything I can do over here? Uh, no, mate, no, I think I'll be right. I think I'll be right. <laughs> Jenny makes a mean margarita. She does. Whoops. Right. Watch out for the knives. Yep. <laughs> Seen a few of those in your time? <laughs> Only from behind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The PM slowly cutting and chatting his way towards his two-hour masala masterpiece. It's straight out of a cookbook, but for his critics, it may as well be straight out of a marketing playbook. And it was someone's idea that this came together in some kind of PR meeting or a marketing uh, exercise of some kind. We made a, a ritual of it as a family. Because yeah. when, I mean, when you do what you know, you do what I do, what yeah. a lot of people do, you live busy lives. You've got to keep a sort of a rhythm to your family. Yeah. So the girls have been having curry since they've been about five yeah. or six. Yeah. Daughters, Abby and Lily, are the only critics I like that one. Yeah. he's listening to tonight. <laughs> it might be their last curry night as a family for a few months, though. Thank you, Lord, for this food. In Jesus' name, amen. There's an election to win amazing. by May, and Scott Morrison has got one hell of a fight on his hands. In his corner, though, he has a secret weapon, his wife, Jenny, who knows the demands of the office better than most. It's just 24-7. Relentless. You know, can you imagine back in the day when Hawk was Prime Minister and he had a phone and he had a fax machine and... Yeah, but it was, Things I think, moved at a different that whole... pace. And, and, but they worked and incredibly hard. They absolutely, worked. they worked. In, I think everyone worked hard. Yeah, yeah. But I think then it was OK to have a holiday and things yeah. like that. And it doesn't seem that way now. Mm. Like, people want you to be seen to be doing something mm. um, all the time. Who can forget the last time the Morrisons took a family holiday? In December 2019, during one of the worst bushfire seasons Australia has ever seen, the PM was pictured holidaying in Hawaii. It was a disaster. Was there a moment when you thought, we've got to get our bags together and leave and go back home? Did, did you get the, the outcry? Absolutely. Look, absolutely. And I am... I am more than sorry for if we disappointed, and not if we, we did disappoint. Did, did we make the right decision? I thought I was making the right decision for my kids. I obviously um, was wrong. Mm. But, you know, yes, we're over there seeing and I'm like, mm. we really need to get home. Yeah. So. I wish that had never happened, mm. but I can't change it. No. The Morrisons did come home. Nah, you're an idiot, mate. Oh. And there was no welcome party. How are you? I'm only shaking It's hands. safe to say they won't be taking a holiday anytime soon, anywhere. The usually private family are instead opening their doors at home, and Jenny is taking centre stage. Good? <clears throat> OK. Jenny, I want you to completely relax here in the knowledge that every one of your answers is going to decide whether he gets re-elected or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no pressure. When Jenny first started dating Scott, she was 17, he was 16. We know they met at church. We know they married in their 20s. We know they recently celebrated their 32nd wedding anniversary. But there was one rocky moment in their teenage love story we've never heard about. There's nothing quite like election campaign confessions. At 16, I heard you had two weeks off there at some point. Um, can I you know. reveal to the nation what that was about? He broke up because he was keen on another girl. What? Yes. Oh, I was an idiot. It was a stupid decision. 
we fixed it pretty quick. What would you say um, to your 16-year-old self now? <laughs> Run! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's probably what I'd say. No, <laughs> absolutely not. Um, yeah, it's been a really long time, but I know him better probably than he knows himself. So. What are his worst traits? Mm, that he's married to the job, but um, we have to take a back seat. Like, running the country is incredibly important. And, um, and I get that. Jenny Morrison isn't afraid to tell it how it is. That's probably it, and he's messy. Perhaps that's why we've heard so little from her in the last three years. Every, look, I'm not a fan of politics, so um, I just find it too, just too much, too ruthless, too much going on. You are refreshingly honest. Have you ever thought about a career in politics? <laughs> no, never, never will. <laughs> never, never, never. Are you sure? That's a definite from me. <laughs> as hard as she's tried to stay out of politics, Jenny Morrison has been dragged into the headlines more than a few times. The most distressing, she says, was when comedian Magda Zabanski sent out this tweet, seeming to make light of her faith. Look, and I can take a joke. Like, I, I, I can take a joke and I... I think I'm quite a strong... I have, I've had to be independent and strong because of the life that I live with Scott. But sometimes it's just like, really? But she said it's part of the job, in, you know, you, you sign up for it, you got to... She did say that, but... It's part of my job. It's never part of the family's job. It's an unofficial rule of politics. Criticise the politician, not the family. But Scott Morrison hasn't exactly helped name-dropping his wife when he's under the pump at media conferences. How many um, rapid tests have you personally paid for? Um, well, I have to check with Jen because she, um, she's the one that goes and, and gets them. She said to me, you have to think about this as a father first. Were you thrown under the bus? No, I don't think so. Like, I think he should be able to yeah. say what happens with us in our life. Yeah. Like, yes, he talks to me regularly. Do yeah. I make policy decisions? Absolutely not. Why Would not? you want me to? Because they'd be bad. But I can tell him how I feel about something. When political staffer Brittany Higgins revealed allegations she'd been raped in Parliament House, Scott Morrison said it took a conversation with his wife to make him act. Were you shocked at the allegations? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, my God. Yes. You know, no one wants to see that. No one wants to hear that. No one wants that to happen to anyone. What was that conversation that you had with you? I was speaking directly to him. Like, I really want to know that our girls are perfectly safe. Mm. Our girls are perfectly safe to be working in a building like that or any building. But that was the premise at the time of, mm. of, of what had just happened. And... And so I was discussing that with Scott. A lot of people, I think, thought, why did it take a conversation with you for him to, to really get it? I think Scott totally gets things. I think <laughs> he is, um, he's all about problem solving. And uh, so that can come across sometimes as uh, serious, uncaring or... Lacking empathy. Kind of lacking empathy. But it, it isn't that at all. It's seriously focus and task orientated. And it can only make things better having more people aware about it and, and change actually happening. Mm. I feel happy that that will happen, that my girls in like 10 years time, heaven forbid, if they want to go into politics, will, you know, can walk safely around and know what's going on. There you go. Congratulations. Last year's Australian of the Year, Grace Tame, has become a role model for many Australian women and men. But it was this awkward exchange with the Morrisons at the lodge that had everyone, except her, talking. Right, well, welcome. Please You know, I just wish the focus had been on all the incredible people coming in. 
I, I just found it a little bit disappointing because we'll welcome you in our home. I think she says she has the right to, to be however um, sure. she wants to be. She doesn't have to answer to anyone. It's, sure. She's a modern woman who's decided that that's her path. Do you respect that? I respect people that, like, want to change things, stand up for their beliefs and are strong, but I still think there's manners and respect. For your daughters, if they look up to a Grace Tame, you know, one day for what Grace Tame can do and make in terms of the decisions she makes about her own life, is that something that you want your daughters to grow up to be like? I want my daughters to grow up to be fierce, strong, yeah. independent, amazing people. And I think they can still do that and show kindness to other people and be polite and have manners. Jenny Morrison might not have signed up for a life in politics, but she's always been a strident defender of her family. She's preparing to hit the campaign trail alongside her husband, and she wants him to win. Why should he continue being Prime Minister? I think the Australian people, on the whole, uh, they, they totally know what's going on. I think they have been very disappointed with seeing some of the things that are going on at the moment. I truly believe that. And sometimes the loudest people take up the most space. But there's a lot of other people out there that are just concentrating on their families mm. and just having a good life. Mm. And I think Scott can give Australians the best of the life that they desire. It's clear we'll be seeing a whole lot more of Jenny Morrison before Election Day. But will it be enough? Fast forward to Election Night, what happens if you lose? The Prime Minister will try and revitalise the Coalition's election chance. The PM will use a major address to admit this summer has been challenging... It's 11am in the nation's capital. PM. And the Prime Minister is putting the finishing touches on a speech to the country. Boy, oh boy, you are at the pump right now. Huh? Well, mate, it's another day in the office. <laughs> <laughs> the office is all over the country and today it's here. Yeah. Down in the polls, Scott Morrison hoped his address at the National Press Club two weeks ago was going to rescue his re-election. I haven't got everything right. And I'll take my fair share of the criticism and the blame. It goes with the job. But at the end of that day, it was not his speech, but a question that had the nation talking. I've been provided with a text message exchange between the former New South Wales Premier mm -hmm. and a current Liberal Cabinet Minister. She describes you as, quote, a horrible, horrible person. The Minister is even more scathing, describing you as a fraud and, quote, a complete psycho. The Prime Minister's wife, Jenny, was watching at home in Sydney. And I heard that question and I actually felt sick to my stomach. I felt sick to my stomach because they were talking about someone that I really care about. And I just thought it was such a poor question with such bad intent um, that those people just have no idea how it would affect my family, that I have grown daughters that um, are going to high school. How do you explain it to your daughters? They know their dad. They know their dad better than anyone else. Did that hurt? Any, you know, you're a human being. A, I didn't believe it for a start. Um, but still, when these things are said, and they were very personal things, and yeah, it was a horrible thing to hear, as it would be for anyone, but does it really distract me? Do I really sometimes expect better? No. That's sad. Well, I've been around politics for a long time and I've seen how it's changed. Australians will soon make their verdict clear nice about Morrison's first full term. The underdog PM knows he has no time to waste hitting the campaign trail in Queensland. How old are you, 
mate? Uh, 18. 18. Good to meet you. In the marginal seat of Longman on Queensland's Sunshine Coast, the PM has brought Jenny along to the quiet town of Woodford. And it's clear she's not comfortable with all the attention. So much, a little bit shy about things, yeah. but um, others Why? I really, really love. You're not shy. Inside the local watering hole, there's a warm welcome for the Morrisons. Yeah, no worries, no worries. How's it going, you reckon? How's it going, the boss? It's a great guy. Love this guy. Oh, Mr. Morrison. He's a member of the Liberal Party. No! Either the pub has been stacked or he's got more supporters than the polls indicate. He says he's focused on those quiet Australians this election. Here we go. How do you actually gauge whether there's enough quiet Australians out there to get Scott Morrison back in power? Well, at the end of the day, you just engage people directly. And one of the things that I'm really enjoying doing is having gotten out of Canberra, where largely we've been pinned down for the last two years. And whenever I get the opportunity, you can hear what people are going through directly. Now, we get those messages back, of course we do. But it's different to be able to sit around a table and talk to them. Can you win it? Of course. Of course. You just focus on doing the job. If you do the job well, then that has its own reward. There are people out there saying you've got no chance. Yeah, they did last time too. <laughs> when Scott Morrison won the election in May 2019, it seemed even he was surprised. I have always believed in miracles. But not even this God-fearing PM could have foreseen how the next three years would unfold. You're the pandemic prime minister. That's, that's, what, uh, that, that's what events in history has dealt. And uh, you, you don't get to decide the circumstances in which you take on roles like this. Did it have its frustrations? Essentially, Australia split. It split into seven different territories with yeah. very parochial leaders. And you're the leader of the country. I don't think anyone was quite aware of of how much power the states had and how much they were prepared to exercise. I, I think that's fair. A lot of people have said, oh, why was so much power given to the states? And they didn't get one skerrick of power. They've always had it. I think the hardest thing for, to reconcile for most Australians is you're the prime minister of the country. Yeah. How can you have no power over the states? Well, you've got to go back and ask the writers of the Constitution. But was that frustrating <laughs> for you? I mean, well, of course it was. And you the PM admits yeah. mistakes were made and his critics say he's been too slow to fix them. The growing number of COVID-related deaths in aged care is one scandal he can't shake. There was real pain and real grief mm. with what happened in facilities that were ostensibly controlled by the federal government. Do you feel responsible for that? Oh, of course. Uh, of course. But I also feel responsible for how we addressed it and turned it around. But, you know, this is what happens in pandemics. You can't avoid these big knocks and they do have impacts, but you can then try and turn the situation around, get it under control and minimise that impact. I think people know you're across detail. Mm. I think they know you work hard. I think sometimes they wonder what lies beneath. Does the Prime Minister feel this? Does he feel our pain? Does he have empathy yeah. for us? Do you? Of course. I said it at the start of the pandemic. I've worn out the carpet on the side of my bed here, particularly down in Canberra, where I spent most of the pandemic, on my knees, praying and praying. Praying not just for our response, but praying for those who are losing loved ones, praying for those who couldn't go to family funerals, praying for those who were exhausted, praying for the young men and women I was sending into aged care centres, which were just, they won't forget what they saw. Does it sometimes take you a while to get this through your thick head, the emotions of it all? Uh, no, no, look, I, I feel it and bleed like everybody else. Do you? Of course I do. How do you bleed? Well, I do it privately and I do it quietly and I do it in the arms of my wife and family. 
Um, I do it with my mum and my brother and my good mates that I have have been mates with me long before politics and will be long after. How do you grab an Australian and say, I'm sorry that you've lost your... You had to say goodbye to your mother th th over a computer. Just, just like that, Carl. Honestly and directly and personally wherever I can. So he said no. That's for now, there's no time for bleeding. He's focused on winning. But he'll need the support of his whole party to get there. The last time a Prime Minister was in your kind of state with the polls, you had to get rid of him. Do well, you, I didn't. Do you sleep with one eye open? No, I, I don't. Do you trust them? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we trust each other. And I, when I became Prime Minister, that's one of the things I wanted to change. And I brought the team together and I just said, look, I'm not going over there to appease that side of the party or that side of the party. I'm going to lead right in the middle here with all of you and I'm, I'm leading, you follow. Try as he might to say he leads a United team, leaked text messages showing his deputy, Barnaby Joyce, calling him a liar, have undoubtedly damaged the Prime Minister already under fire. Before the last election, yeah. you prayed for a miracle? Yeah. I pray for miracles every day, Carl. <laughs> What are you praying for this time? I, I pray particularly for Australians that they will come through this together. That's the thing I most pray for. You might need more than a miracle this time. You might need the second coming. <laughs> well, I believe in that too. <laughs> if there is no second coming, Scott Morrison will always have the support of his loving daughters. Like um, to have your dad as the prime minister. I mean, it's good. I would, we're used to him yeah. being, doing this stuff because he was doing it since I was born, actually, yeah. 2007, so. Yeah. yeah. And are you proud of him? Yes. Yeah. Why are you proud of him? Well, because Because he does hard dad. work every day. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was a better answer. <laughs> you get the feeling, either way, the PM has one eye on paradise, wherever that is. But everyone knows the chorus. Yeah, go. Take me to the April sun in Cuba. Oh. Take me to the April sun in Cuba. I can't remember the words. Oh. Come on, Jed, get into it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Fast forward to election night. What happens if you lose? If we lose? Life just goes on. Exactly. We go back to our home, go back to our friends and family and get on with things. Then you can go to Hawaii. Carl. Too soon. Too soon. <laughs> Too soon. Too soon. Now, of course, we're well aware Scott Morrison faces stiff political opposition, but be assured we'll be bringing you a story featuring ALP leader Anthony Albanese in the next few weeks. Hello, I'm Sarah Arbo. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on ninenow.com.au and the Nine Now app.